Hi, my name is Earth Ranger Julia, and I'm here with Earth Ranger Josh at Ogden School in Thunder Bay, Ontario. We're about to do an hour-long assembly with some live animal ambassadors, teaching the students here about how to take care of our environment. So, enjoy. My name is Julia. And my name is Josh, and we are, of course, the Earth Rangers. Now, boys and girls, we saw lots of examples of animals being helped all around our planet in that video. And this kind of stuff, coming together to help protect the animals and their homes, this is what being an Earth Ranger is all about. And that makes me a bit curious. Do we happen to have any official Earth Rangers here in the audience today? Maybe a show of hands? That is awesome. Tons of hands up in the audience. Great to see. Those of you who have no idea what Earth Rangers is about, you will find out what we do very shortly. But Julia and I are super excited to be here at your school today. Not only do we travel all across Canada visiting schools like your own, but we also sometimes get invited to special events or functions. And most recently, we were invited to our nation's capital to speak to someone I think you will all recognize about some of the incredible things being done by Earth Rangers. So let's take a look. Hi, I'm Justin Trudeau. I'm the Prime Minister of Canada. I'm really glad to be here today uh, at Parliament uh, to introduce you to some friends of mine. This is Tova and Karin from Earth Rangers, and they've got someone very special here with us. Yeah, this is Kendall. He's a peregrine falcon. Peregrine falcons are actually found all across Canada, from British Columbia to Newfoundland. They've made an incredible comeback and are now actually off the endangered species list. So it's a great example of how when people work together, we really can protect animals. Uh, that's awesome. That's, that's not just uh, the only thing that Earth Rangers does, is it? Exactly. Um, Earth Rangers is the kids' conservation organization. We represent a community of over 150,000 kids and their families who take action every day to protect animals and the environment. And education is also a big part of what we do. In fact, the kids that are watching this right now are about to experience our school assembly program, which travels to over 800 schools across Canada in every province and territory each year. Well, I mean, this is uh, one thing that I believe deeply in. Each and every one of us can and must make a difference in the world. And how uh, we get involved to protect the environment through organizations like Earth Rangers, uh, being active in your community, in your school, uh, at home with your family, uh, how we think about the world we live in and the impact we have on it is really, really important. And that's uh, one of the reasons why my government is taking it so seriously, to make sure we're protecting the environment, make sure we're cleaning up pollution, uh, making sure we're doing everything to make the world uh, a better place. And you have a really important role to play in that. To get involved, kids can visit earthrangers.com where they can sign up for a free membership. We've actually uh, got your membership card right here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> so you very much, an official Tova. Member. And as members, they can participate in really special environmental saving missions, things like finding all the energy wasters in their house through Operation Conservation, learning about the role of Indigenous peoples in conservation through ATK in Action, and discovering Canada's national parks through Outdoor Explorer. Um, they can also participate in a lot of really cool conservation projects like protecting belugas in the St. Lawrence River and woodland caribou in northern Alberta, just to name a couple of this year's projects. Listen, there are lots of amazing projects for you to get involved in. So I want to thank all of you for taking an interest in this, for getting involved with the Earth Rangers, for being active, engaged members of your community, of your school, and for pushing your family and your friends uh, to do things that are responsible for the environment and to improve our world. A lot of times you might hear people tell you that you're the leaders of tomorrow. Well, I don't want you to think of yourselves as leaders of tomorrow. I want you to understand that you are leaders today, right now. What you do uh, matters in the world, and I really thank you for it. That is right, boys and girls. Some very wise words from our Prime Minister. So let's give him a nice big round of applause. Now you see, it is very important that we work hard to protect animals as well as their homes because we have a pretty serious problem. A lot of the animals all over our planet are at risk of disappearing completely. And as Earth Rangers, we need to take action. So we are going to reveal this year's five new Bring Back the Wild Project animals, talk to you guys about our partners and what they're doing to help protect animals and their homes all across the country, and show you how you can become Earth Rangers and start helping to protect animals too. But first, do you guys want to meet some animals? Yeah! That is fantastic to hear because today we would like to introduce you to some of the incredible creatures that we share our planet with.
very first guest comes to us all the way from the rainforest of South America, and not many animals are brave enough to take on the protective spikes that cover her entire body. So everyone, welcome Quillo. All right. Now, my friend here is an amazing climber. I heard someone saying a hedgehog, but that's not entirely true. She's, she's something different. She's another kind of animal that has spikes all over her body. Does anybody know what she is? How about in the pink shirt right here? Uh, not a hedgehog, you're very close. All right, how about in the blue shirt right here? A porcupine, absolutely right. Now she is definitely a porcupine. Have you guys ever seen a porcupine here in Canada before? Sorry, some of you have, some of you haven't. Well, we can definitely find porcupines in Canada, but they look completely different. Quillo here does come from South America. That makes her completely different from the ones here. The main difference is this really long tail that she has. It's actually where she gets her name. She is called a prehensile tailed porcupine. Now that's a pretty long name, isn't it? So just to make sure that you guys all remember what it is, I want you to repeat after me, all right? She's a prehensile, Tailed, tailed porcupine. porcupine it is quite a mouthful isn't it very long name but this word this prehensile tail describes this tail really nicely see how she's using it to grab onto that branch there she's using it kind of like a safety net in South America where she lives very high up in the trees if it's a little bit wet it tends to rain a lot there maybe those branches are slippery maybe a branch were to break that could be a really long drop down to the ground but having this tail that can grab onto other branches helps prevent this. She's not going to make that very long fall. So it's very, very important for animals that live up in trees. For example, there's other animals that live up in trees that have the same kind of tail. Do you guys think monkeys have these prehensile tails? What do you think? They do, they absolutely do. Monkeys definitely have a tail that can grab onto branches that they can hang from. But what about something like a dog? Does a dog have a prehensile tail? No, you're absolutely right. So definitely important to many animals that live up in trees. But when we talk about porcupines, there is one thing that we think of the most, and that is these, these spikes that cover her entire body. Now, they are called, there's a very special name for it, I think you said it? Quills, exactly, they are called quills, and they are a little bit more special than just being spikes. They are definitely sharp. They kind of work like a suit of armor for her. They protect her from many different predators. But do you guys think porcupines can shoot their quills? No, you know what, you're very smart. A lot of other schools that we have gone to have thought that they shoot their quills. And a lot of people do think this. The reason is because sometimes you see animals like our dogs and cats, for example, that have quills that are stuck in their nose or their face. The reason for this is because those dogs and cats have actually gone and touched a porcupine. The porcupine obviously didn't like this too much. But the reason why that they stick into animal skin is because they are very loosely attached into a porcupine skin, which means that they fall out really easily. Quillow here could just brush up against a tree, and some of these quills could actually just fall out from that. But when she puffs up and sticks these quills straight out, making herself look twice as big, and a predator were to come by and actually touch her, these quills, the pointy ends are a little bit sticky. And what I mean by that is they have a barb on the end. Have you guys ever seen a fishing hook before? All right, you know how fishing hooks have that extra spike close to the end that comes off the side? It's a little bit funny looking. Well, that is called a barb, and all of Quillow's quills have one of those as well, except it's really, really small. But Quillow here is actually the newest member of our animal ambassador team. She hasn't been doing these schools for very long. She hasn't been coming out in front of really large audiences, but you can see just how comfortable she was. She had her quills down completely. She wasn't bugged at all. And I think that she has done a fantastic job. Let's give Quillow a nice big round of applause today. Thank you so much to Quillow for hanging out with us today. And we are super lucky that we still have animals like prehensile tailed porcupines living out in the wild. And as Earth Rangers, we work with people and agencies all over the world to help protect animals just like them. Right now, I'd like to tell you guys about a scientist who is doing exactly that. Now, her name is Sabina Wilhelm, and she is a seabird biologist. Her job is to lead the Colonial Seabird Monitoring Program, which, like its name suggests, monitors seabirds off the coast of Newfoundland 
Ant and Labrador. Birds like gulls, puffins, as well as terns. Now, Sabina's job is to conduct ground as well as aerial surveys of these seabirds, which means she gets to fly over huge colonies of birds, see what kinds and how many are nesting in a particular area. But not just that, she also gets to walk among these colonies of birds on remote islands where no one else is allowed to go to see how healthy these populations are. But we are talking up to 2 million birds all in one place, more than 26 football stadiums full of seabirds. Now, not only is Sabina's job pretty cool, it is also very important because the birds she studies are called indicator species. So that means information about the health of these birds can be used to determine the health of the entire ecosystem. But not just that, how human activity is having an impact on these ecosystems. Now you see, there are quite a few things we do as humans that are not so good for our planet. But one that is particularly troublesome for birds is called light pollution. Now you see, when young puffins or pufflings are ready to leave their nest for the very first time, they wait until the cover of night. Because if they try to leave during the day, bigger birds like seagulls might try to catch them. So what their plan is, is guided by the light of the moon to fly out into the middle of the ocean. That is where they will spend the first few years of their life because they're nice and safe out there. However, on foggy nights, or for whatever reason, the moon is not visible. These birds got confused by lights coming off buildings and towns, and they head towards these coastal towns instead of safe waters offshore. Now, once they're inside of these towns, they get a little bit confused and they become stranded. They can't find their way back out into the ocean, and they're in trouble of getting struck by cars or caught by other animals like dogs and cats. But this is where Sabina and members of the community, including volunteers, like students like yourselves, will patrol these streets every night during the puffins breeding season, early August to early September, and they will go looking for these stranded puffins. Now, once they find them in these streets, they will place them in very safe places. Basically, they will keep them in a crate, keep them in a safe place throughout the night, and then the following morning, they will all meet on a beach off Whitless Bay for their release back out there to the ocean. But before they release them, Sabina makes sure that she weighs and measures them. This will give her very valuable information as to the conditions of that breeding season. She will also place a special metal band on their leg. And this is very important because it will give her information about their future movements as well as survival. Now, this Puffin Patrol has become so popular that they have volunteers flying in from all across our planet to take part in this amazing conservation program. And since the program began back in 2011, close to 1,500 pufflings have been saved. I think that is pretty incredible. They are making a huge difference out there. Do you guys think Sabina is doing a great job protecting those puffins? Show of hands. That is awesome. And you know what? It is thanks to the efforts of people like Sabina, as well as volunteers from the community like yourselves, that we still have our next animal ambassador alive in the wild. Now, before we bring out our next animal ambassador, I need you guys to do me two very important favors. Can you guys do me two important favors? Yeah. All right. The first favor is while our next animal is out here, I need everybody to make sure that you stay seated flat on your bottoms the entire time. Nobody up on your knees, nobody shifting around, making sudden movements. That also goes for a couple of the, the um, adults in the back there. If you can find a quick seat, please, that would be fantastic. Perfect. All right. Second favor is while our animal is out here, some of you might get a very close up look. And if this happens, I need you to make sure that you keep your hands to yourself. So keep them close to your body, keep them in your lap, sit on them if you have to, but please do not reach up and try and touch our animal. Sound good? Yeah. All right, perfect. Then it is time to introduce you to an animal that some of you might have seen before. You can find them in your own backyard sometimes. He is incredibly fast and he's actually capable of taking down a bird that is twice as big as he is. Everybody, welcome Maverick. <laughs> Maverick loves to make an entrance. Now boys and girls, Josh and I are good bird trainers, but it is nearly impossible to potty train an American kestrel. Don't worry, we will clean that up very shortly. Now. Maverick here is a type of bird called an American kestrel, but I wanna see if you guys can guess what group of animals an American kestrel belongs to. Here are your possible options. Is an American kestrel a type of falcon, 
a type of songbird, or a type of parrot. Hands up if you think that maverick is a type of songbird. All right, a few hands. I can see why you would think that he is quite a small bird. How about if you think that maverick is a type of parrot? All right, a few hands for that as well. He is very colorful. How about if you think he is a type of falcon? Yeah, you guys are exactly right. American kestrels are definitely falcons. They are the smallest members of the falcon family that you can find right here in North America, just like Josh mentioned, sometimes, sometimes even in your very own backyard. And being falcons, they are birds of prey, which means they will eat other animals, but they're excellent, excellent predators. They will use their incredible speed to catch their favorite food. They have a streamlined body, very narrow and pointed wings, and very stiff feathers. And these things combined allow him to reach some really great speeds. And that is how they catch their favorite food, which is other birds. Now, Maverick here, what kind of birds do you guys think he might like to catch? A smaller bird or a bigger bird? A bigger bird, exactly. American kestrels love to catch birds that are up to twice as big as they are. And the way they do this is they start to fly really, really quickly. And then they'll take their talons, ball them up into little fists, and punch that other bird right out of the air. The other bird falls down to the ground, gets a little bit confused, but Maverick here can have himself a meal. Now, do you guys want to see how fast Maverick can fly? Yeah. All right. Oops. <laughs> Maverick's always making friends. And we'll do that a couple more times so you guys can all get a good look at our friend Maverick here. We'll have him come back to the front again. He's getting nice and fluffy on that back perch. That means he is really comfortable. But that also means that flying might be the last thing on his mind right now. Now we like to joke around that Maverick picks favorite animal handlers. He has clearly picked Josh as his favorite today. <laughs> But as soon as he is ready, he'll put all his feathers down, kind of crouch down. You can definitely tell when he is ready. We'll see if he feels like coming up back here again. There he goes. And we will do that one more time for, from this side so you guys can all get a close look at him as well. to the front. <laughs> Maverick loves to put me on the spot. I have some nice pieces of steak here for him. If he feels like coming back to the front. There he is. All right. So we all saw how quickly he can fly. What an amazing flyer he is. But for this next part, I'm going to send Maverick to the back again to hang out with Josh. And Josh is going to hide him from us because he cannot see what I am about to take out of my pocket. Now, what I have here, it's called a lure. It once looked like a butterfly, now it's just a green blob with a weight inside of it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Maverick demonstrate just what an amazing hunter he is. So I'm going to toss this up into the air and we're going to see if Maverick feels like either punching it out of the air like he would with another bird or he might even catch it mid-flight and swoop down with his prize. So do you guys wanna see this? Yeah! All right, here we go. <laughs> oh, Maverick. All right, we'll give him a second. We'll have Josh reset him. Maybe I'll give him a pep talk. <laughs> Maybe we can all cheer him on. Go, Maverick! You can do it! 
All right, Maverick, everyone believes in you. Here we go. <laughs> Boys and girls, this is the thing when you work with animals. Oh, he looks like it. He looks like he wants to. Oh, oh, oh. You know what, boys and girls? This is the thing when you work with animals, we cannot force them to do something that they don't want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to have Josh walk, walk back up to the front with my friend Maverick. He has showed us what an amazing flyer he is. And I think he deserves a huge round of applause for coming out here today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Maverick. Here is a little bit of trivia about Maverick. You can hear him back there. He's pretty pleased with himself. He knew if he didn't want to do that, that little behavior about putting all that work into catching that lure, he doesn't have to. We never push our animals if they're not feeling completely comfortable with doing their routine. As Julia mentioned, that is one of the perks with working with animals. You definitely work at their pace. But it does take a lot of people working together to help protect animals and their homes. And that is why we would like to introduce you to another one of our partners and show all of you guys what they are doing to help out wildlife. Their group is called the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, or SFI for short. And they work to ensure that when trees are used for the building purposes of your homes, maybe even your schools, even the paper products like the notebooks that you use in class, they make sure that those trees are taken in a way that does not affect the welfare of the local wildlife. They ensure that this happens by creating special standards or rules for forestry managers to follow, but also by supporting local forestry research. And that helps improve the health of those forests, but not only that, it also identifies areas that are critical for conservation of many of our animals we can find here in Canada. But right now we want to talk to you guys about one of their projects that they are working on in an area of Quebec called Cano. All right, who here has heard of a swimming pool before? Lots of hands up. Awesome, all right, what about tidal pools? Show of hands. All right, a couple hands went down. What about wading pools? All right, still a couple hands. Now what about vernal pools? You know what, a lot of hands went down. That is totally okay, because not a lot of people have ever heard of a vernal pool, but they are very important. Now to put it in very simple words, a vernal pool is a seasonal body of water that is created from an impression in the forest floor that fills up with either melted snow or rainfall. They are very shallow and they can range in size from a large puddle to a small pond. They are often hidden away in very dense forests and they have a tendency to disappear. Well, sort of. You see, these vernal pools can be what is called ephemeral and that means that after about three to five months, they will completely dry up, basically disappearing from the forest. Or they can be what is called semi-permanent, and this means that they will normally only partially dry up. There will always be a little bit of water left over. Either way, these pools are very important, as I said earlier. If you've ever found yourself coming across one as a walk through the woods, believe it or not, you have stumbled upon a wildlife hotspot. That is because as scientists are discovering, these vernal pools are important to many different woodland creatures like raccoons, ducks, hawks, but especially amphibians. Now, can anyone out there give me an example of an amphibian? Any examples? What right here in the blue? What do you think? Did you forget? That's all right, I forget things all the time. Out in the back there, yes. Frogs. Frogs are probably the most famous example of amphibians. Any other examples? Yes? A toad? For sure. Yep. Frogs and toads. How about someone from this side? How about right here? Yes. You know what? A lizard is very close. A lizard belongs to the group of reptiles. And reptiles and amphibians are very closely related, but I am looking for one in particular that looks like a lizard. Starts with the letter S. Yes. A salamander. Absolutely right. So lots of toads, frogs, and salamanders, lots of different amphibians, and vernal pools are important to all of these amphibians because the water comes from melted snow or rainfall and not from rivers or streams, and that means that they're often free of hungry fish 
making them an excellent breeding ground for all of these different types of amphibians. But what makes up one of these vernal pool habitats isn't just the water, it is also the forest surrounding these bodies of water. In fact, these forests are so important, they're often referred to as the life zone. And those amphibians that we mentioned earlier rely on this life zone for their survival. Now, when... So, sorry, let's take a look at the life cycle of an amphibian, a frog, for example. So this is what frogs look like inside the egg. Can you guys tell me what happens next? What happens after this? Uh, what do you think in the green shirt? They turn into tadpoles, exactly. And you find tadpoles living in water, swimming around. However, adult frogs, you often find living out on land. That is because amphibians need both water as well as the land to survive. That is kind of what being an amphibian is all about. Now, adult frogs and salamanders, you can often find them deep in forest leaf litter or under decaying logs because this offers them food, shelter, as well as shade. However, young or juvenile frogs and salamanders, you can often find only 100 feet away from these vernal pool habitats. They never venture further, further than this distance. Adults, or uh, ones that are at least two years old, they will venture a little bit farther, but often return in the fall to hibernate close to the breeding area. Now, even though scientists are finding out a lot about these vernal pool habitats, there is still a lot left to discover. First, we don't know exactly what kind of animals walk through them and use them, and because they're hidden away in those dense forests, we're not exactly sure where exactly they are located. So, to learn more about them, SFI is assembling a team of scientists and volunteers to venture out into the wilds of Kano. They'll be collecting some water samples and sending these water samples off to a laboratory. There, they will do DNA analysis to find out what kinds of animals have walked through these waters, but not just that, they'll also be using satellite light imaging to map these vernal pool areas and by knowing exactly where they are located we'll be better able to protect them for future generations of frogs and salamanders to come now i think that the sustainable forestry initiative deserve a huge round of applause for all their incredible earth rangers work amazing now for our next guest we are going to meet a bird that you probably have also seen because they like to sit perched on top of telephone poles and fence posts waiting for their next meal. Now before he comes out, boys and girls, I would like to remind you of those two very important rules for when Maverick was out here. So please make sure you stay seated flat on your bottoms and please do not reach up and try to touch our animals. Sound good? Yeah. All right, but most importantly, please give a very warm welcome to Hook. All right. Now, this is Hook. He is not an owl. He is a completely different kind of bird of prey. Like Julia mentioned, you might have seen them here in Ontario. They are called a red-tailed hawk. Have you guys ever heard of a red-tailed hawk before? Yeah. All right, some of you have. You know what? They're very common around here, and an easy way to identify them next time you're driving around any big roads or highways is look for these red tail feathers. Now, it does take them about two years of age before they get these feathers in. Before that time, they're kind of all grayish brown like the rest of his body. But if they are of age, it is very easy to identify them. And like I said, you can find them just about anywhere. Now, they are a bird of prey like Maverick. They will hunt things like other birds, but they're not that picky. They will hunt things like rabbits and squirrels, mice, even sometimes roadkill. And that's kind of why you find them around any of the roads. Because sometimes, if they don't want to put any work into hunting, if they just hang around a road, eventually a meal will come to them. Now, as you can see, he does have very big wings, a lot bigger than my friend Maverick here. He is pretty fast, but he's not quite as fast as Maverick was. He doesn't use his speed to catch his food, he uses his strength and those big wings to soar across his habitat looking for food until he finds them and swoops down to grab them with his feet. But because we let Maverick fly around, I think it is only fair we let Hook fly as well. We are going to have him make a couple flights. Boys and girls, make sure you watch those wings of his. And if you watch closely, right before he lands, he fans out his tail feathers, those nice red tail feathers of his, kind of putting on the brakes. We'll see that once more. Now, Hook here, he's not quite